Um, so uh, we have a first plenary this morning, and then we take a little break, and then we have a closing session for us to debrief and wrap up together. Um, I want to start out by thanking Mark Panate and Borderlands for last night's fiesta. Oh. Um, and also thanking him for curating this morning's panel, which is going to talk, uh, let us hear about the process and everything that happened during putting together the original Barrio Stories uh, project earlier this year in Barrio Anita uh, and everything that came out of that. And for those of you who maybe have not clued into this, um, Barrio Stories uh, and their collaboration with Spoken Futures with the youth poets, some of whom you heard last night, was a recipient of a Net 10 exchange grant which is part of what made that happen. Um, they also uh, were the recipient of each year we give one continuation grant through the Net 10 program, which is for folks who have come through a project that was awarded funding through an exchange grant and want to continue working together. And so we do one of those a year. And this year, uh, Borderlands and Spoken Futures uh, are the recipients of that grant as well. Um, <laughs> And uh, Sarah Gonzalez, who you heard on the panel uh, yesterday morning, uh, is the co-director of Spoken Futures, that organization that is the collaborator, uh, and has a little surprise for us that's going to be at the top of our closing session. But, so a little teaser, uh, but for now, I'm happy to introduce the panel for Barrio Story. Stories project. What, what you guys experienced was uh, maybe like one fifth of like the overall, but really spread. If any of you guys made the walk to the bathrooms, it was all the way to the Ori Center, this big vacant lot in the middle. And if you count the architectural tour and the audio tour, like it was throughout the entire neighborhood. Uh, but uh, we're going to start off with just some introductions um, and uh, sort of like how. You got involved in the in the project, and sort of like what your initial thoughts were. My first thing. Hi, uh, my name is Steve Arnquist. I'm the chief of staff for uh, City Council woman who represents the west side of Tucson and Barrio Vita. Um and I sort of got involved uh, in the, the process a little bit later than some. Uh, there was another person in our office who was, who was sort of on the original collaborating team. Um, and I sort of took over from them, so I missed the first couple of meetings, I think. But, uh, <laughs> um, but you know, our interest was, was in sort of highlighting, um, you know, the uniqueness of Mario Nita and Yeah, and you know, I sort of, going into it, I really was thinking of this very wrongly, I think. I was thinking of it very much as, as being sort of a presentation for the community to see, to learn about Barrio Nita, which, which that was a piece of it, but um, I really didn't understand or didn't appreciate how trans, how much of an impact it was gonna actually make on the neighborhood itself. Um, so that was definitely the coolest thing for, for me to see. Do we need, do we need this? Yes. 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 Yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> Want to make sure. Hi, I'm Tanya Moreno, um, and I'm a resident in Barrio Anita. Um, and so my, I guess my interest, obviously, in the project is a personal one. Um, however, I'm also the grant manager of the Primavera Foundation, which is a local community development organization. Um, and we have a women's shelter in, in that community. And so we, um, we work with um, 
communities experiencing homelessness, and we address uh, root causes of, of poverty and economic justice issue areas in Tucson. So I have kind of a dual interest or a role in, in that that community represents not only my physical home, um, but also um, part of what, um, where I work. Um, so I think my, my original thoughts were um, being really excited about it as a resident because um, I'm one of the newer residents there. We've lived there about six, six years, close to seven years. Um, so anything obviously that was going to integrate myself and my family more in the community um, made me really excited. Um, and then hearing just briefly about some of the processes that were uh, going to happen through utilizing art as a medium um, were particularly relevant to me and exciting to me as a community organizer. That's kind of what my background is. So not having a whole lot of knowledge and experience in the art world, but seeing how that could be used um, to kind of integrate and weave together other disciplines was, um, was particularly interesting for me. So I was really honored to be asked to be a part of it. Thank you. Uh, and again, my name is Mark Pinate uh, with Borderlands Theater. Uh, I sort of convened uh, or conceived of the project and also convened the different uh, partners and different individuals that would be part of it, artists, um, uh, you know, city, city leaders, residents, uh, uh, and, and the university, and a bunch of different partners. Uh, and this was the second um, uh, Bible Stories project. We had done one two years earlier that I'll speak briefly on. Uh, we're supposed to have a fourth panelist, Adam Cooper Theran, who was uh, one of the lead artists. I'm hoping All Souls has not gotten to him completely. <laughs> He'll make it here, but if he, he can't, I'll, I'll talk on his behalf. But um, and so you know, the the overall idea of Barrio Stories is uh, to celebrate the history and heritage of Mexican American. Uh, Americans here, the, the community, in, in, through their historic values. And there's several throughout Tucson. There's uh, Barrio Hollywood, Barrio Centro, El Oyo. There's a bunch. I can't remember, remember them all. Uh, right. Uh, and, uh, and there's all a sense of pride uh, within each, all of them. And there's definitely a history to all of them. Uh, and they all have some, some really incredible, I mean, like any neighborhood, you can dig a party <coughs> anywhere in the world, you're going to find, because it's human beings that make up the, those neighborhoods, and human beings are incredible, resilient, in, you know, entities. Uh, and so, you, uh, the idea also uh, is to, was to uh, bring the contributions of the Mexican-American community here in Tucson uh, throughout its entire existence, um, uh, bring to light, and, and bring those stories back into the narrative of Tucson, the old Pueblo, um, that, uh, that, you know, some of these stories have been erased, you know, some inadvertently, some on purpose, uh, in different eras of the evolution of Tucson and Southern Arizona. Uh, but, uh, you know, certainly the Mexican-American community uh, is a big part of the character of Tucson and of these neighborhoods and certainly the, the cuisine, the culture, everything. Uh, and so the first project um, happened in, uh, uh, at the convention center, and that was about the very first barrio that is no longer exists, the oldest barrio that was right in the city center downtown area that was demolished uh, through urban renewal uh, in the 60s as, as many similar areas around the country were, where uh, people of color uh, were uh, pushed out. Right? Uh, and so now the, the convention center stands. So what I did was collected all these stories and presented them on the same grounds where they happened. Uh, so we tried to kind of recreate the vibe within the modernist uh, architecture of the, the convention center grounds now. Uh, and with, uh, we had we used a lot of actors for that one. That was the first one. Um, and we created, put up Adobe walls, and we told different stories. Um, this is a piece called Dirt that Ile Romero wrote, who's in the audience right there. Uh, and also the giant puppets you saw earlier was another piece um, uh, by Ile Romero um, about the La Calle, um, La Placita village that was lost. Um, and, um, and, we, and so it was very site-specific, 
creative place making project uh, and went very successful. This was in 2016 uh, and it was very successful. We had about uh, close to 4,000 people come out over four days, about almost 2,000 TUSD students bust out for it. Uh, big success. And so two years later, um, we ended up uh, looking at Barrio Anita. Uh, the idea was, because of the success of the first one, is to every few years to try to find a new barrio and try to focus on it. And find the funding, of course, that's always, nothing happens otherwise. Um, and the question was, well, what are we going to do next? And why, and so Barrio Anita, why Barrio Anita? Uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot of reasons, uh, some, some of it is, was just like the conditions, uh, sort of timing, but um, it is uh, one of the oldest barrios, uh, you know, the, the closer to the downtown area, the older they get. Um, and as people, you know, are sort of forced to move out, they move further out of the circumference and create new barrios. Um, there, there was, um, it just it has a really great history. There's also been other oral history projects done in the early 2000s uh, about that. So we had some material uh, to, to work with already. Um, and uh, there's still a little, a little corner store. It still is in existence and works. Um, and so that's one of the characteristics that's often lost in a lot of the other, other barrios. But it used to, used to be Chinese grocers that all had like multiple stores and all these that's a, that's a whole other story behind that. Um, but um, for these reasons, also proximity to, to Borderlands, uh, it's like a mile from our offices, um, so it's really easy to go back and forth. And then um, Ori Center, uh, had, which is the Parks and Rec you know, Neighborhood Center, is really just was starting to build itself up. They put got some new staff, uh, and we've done like a shadow theater project a year earlier there, and so it was just a lot of factors that kind of led to that. Um, but there's, I'm gonna let uh, Steve talk a little bit more about some of the um, more sort of demographic or factual information about about the neighborhood to kind of get you up to speed. Uh, and then I'll let, as a resident, Tanya just talk a little bit about sort of setting the stage of what Barrio Anita is. Yeah, um, Barrio Anita is, is uh, I mean it's interesting for 101 reasons, but uh, I know one of the things that that made it I think maybe in retrospect maybe it was more part of Mark's plan um, was because it's really small. Um, Barrio Anita has about 200 homes. Um, that probably puts it at I don't know 500 600 residents. Um, you know, but it's it's. It's small enough that, you know, for example, we were able to knock on all the doors at the beginning of the, pro of the process. We were, you know, able to, you know, just start uh, start recognizing people, you know, for, for myself. Um, and makes it a little easier, I think, to see the result. You know, some of this stuff could get lost in a neighborhood of 10, 15,000 people, whereas in a neighborhood of 500, you, you just see it. Uh, so, I mean, you know, Barrio Anita is a traditionally Mexican-American neighborhood. Um, traditionally had seven Chinese stores. Um, now, does still have a neighborhood store, uh, but obviously most of those are closed. Um, oh, I guess the other, the other thing, well, I guess I sort of said it, but was that not only was it easier to sort of see the results, but um, You know, it's a, working in a city council office, we work with 29 different neighborhoods, and then and that only covers about half the people that we represent. So it's really hard to get really in there and really, anyway, sort of see it. Um, so that's been really helpful for, for us. Um, but the, I don't know if this is unique, but I seem to find more historic photos of Barrio Nita than the other barrios. Um, which I think is neat. I like looking at old photos and that kind of thing. Uh, even though it's always been one of the smaller barrios, it was like some more kind of records and stuff. Um, Did you want me to touch on anything else? So, um, <clears throat> you know, our barrio is, is a barrio. And if you've lived in a barrio, you've lived in the hood, you've lived in the ghetto, you, I mean, 
there's not much more I could say than that in some ways, right? You know it when you feel it. You know it when you smell it. You know it when you hear it. Barbarita is a loud barrio. You know, we're physically bound by the train on one side that runs multiple times and your house shakes and people come over and visit and they're like, yo, how can you live with that train like that? And you're like, I don't even hear it anymore because it's so integrated into my like day to day. Um, you know, the kids went in the goes to the, the school in the back of the school year and the kids stop, they lift the train and then they resume like play or whatever. Um, so we're bound by, the, by, you know, our physical environment is the train on one side, a freeway, on the other with that huge wall that you all saw the, constructed with the mural tile. Um, the school, basically on this side, and then Speedway, one of the major um, roads um, in, the, in the city on the, on the northern part. So within this very loud, for Tucson, which you know, I, I, I came from here from the Bay Area, is not like an urban, urban environment to me, but it's still classified as a metro urban area. It's as urban as it can get, right? Probably one of the more urban barrios and that everything around us is street and loud and, and all of that. Um, that's a physical environment. Um, so I would say the, the, the center of the barrio is families who have been there for generations. Generations upon generations, there's probably five families. Five families that um, <clears throat> have lived there at, at minimum four generations, probably. Um, and have, in addition to if they're fortunate, they might have a grandma or great grandma, their nana and tata still living there. They also have tias and cousins, and now you know have either at some point in time moved in and out of the of that neighborhood. Um, and have, you know, Tucson has a very low, low homeowner rate. We're slightly less than 30%, which is drastically lower than the national average. Um, Barrio Anita is, I think it's kind of unique in that a lot of the homes are actually owned by people. So we've, in some ways, that has been a way that we've been able, I think, to curtail some of the gentrification that has happened in other barrios. Um, and you will see, when you, if you've gone through there, you'll see multiple homes that have signs up that says, my home is not for sale because it's not uncommon to have people knocking on your door regularly saying, hey, I got a deal for you. We have a lot of predatory um, home buyers that try to go in there and flip homes. Um, we had a story of, of, of an elder who um, had like a $10,000 um, uh, bill that she needed to basically, she would have to pay to fix the electric and other things in her home. Wasn't able to do that, somebody came by um, bought her home for 25000 flipped it for over 200000 And so now her and her whole family are displaced from that community. So displacement because of economics is not anything new to Barrios. Um, displacement because of substance abuse. Displacement, uh, displacement because of having family members incarcerated. That's kind of like, you know, that's the background. That's the background of the body. Um, and what we've seen in the past few years is a lot of the people who are locked up coming back to the neighborhood. A lot of people who were addicts, have been clean and sober, coming back into the neighborhood. You know, people my age maybe moved out because they were looking for other educational or economic or what have you, um, opportunities kind of coming back. Which I think is kind of human nature too. You get to kind of a certain age and there's this nostalgia and there's this craving to be back at your roots. Um, so I think right now it's an interesting time in Barrio Anita. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of this, this flowing of energy back into that barrio um, of, of people who are from there, um, people who want to be from there, <laughs> and people who want to profit, whether it be from the, the, the cultural experience of the area, the, um, the real estate, you know, from that, whatever that looks like, there's always people who want to profit off of, off of something. So you have a lot of antagonistic energy, you know, and that gets, and that gets played out in multiple ways. You know, we see that. Um, we see that in, in meetings. We saw it a little bit in maybe some of the, the initial resistance to being part of projects. You know, prior to this, there had been um, an art project that was really detrimental to that community. Um, the mural project served as a really divisive project. And there's people who still to this day are so angry about it that um, refuse to take part in any kind of collective community action. Um, but you also have people like my neighbor, who is 80 some years old, um, and one day I was walking to have a bad back, and at times I have to use a walker or a cane, and um, you know, I was walking, and she's calling me from her door, and she's like, niña, niña, 
And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, get my soul. What happened to your back? And you know, I'm telling her, well, you know, my back's messed up. And the next morning, um, she has a little box that she left of some of medicine, you know, homemade like medicine that she's made of, of pomada. Um, and, and she put a little note, you know, I hope you feel better. Call me if you need me to massage your back or whatever. So, you know, you have this kind of like continuum of relationships. And I think you have um, what, I, what I call um, a level of cultural humility. You know, it's, it's cultural humility you see that, that has been expressed by people who have been fully integrated into that community and have been welcomed. You know, discussing with another neighbor who, or not neighbor, but another person in the neighborhood who hasn't been as fortunate as I have been in having the doors open to them and being invited to the family dinners and all that. And, you know, and, and I shared with him, you know, you might want to practice a little bit of that. Because I think when you, I think when you show that you, a level of humility and say, I'm not from here, you know, my family's from Barrio Libre, from the barrio that Mark spoke about, that one of the barrios that got destroyed um, when the expansion happened downtown. So my family knew what it was to be displaced. And from Barrio Libre, they moved to another Barrio La Capilla, which is a Yaqui community. My family's Yaqui. And I always remembered that my dad would say it was, it was a hard transition for us, because we were Barrio Libre. And when you're from a barrio, you don't go to other barrios. You don't live in other barrios. You don't even drive through other barrios if it can be avoided during that time. Um, so I felt like, wow, I need to go above and beyond to express this level of like outsiderness. Um, but be really humble about like how can I be here to be part of you, um, and and I've seen that you know I've seen those families that you know like have nothing and yet show up at your kid's party with like a box of Ichis or something you know I, I've seen that kind of like resiliency that I think that um, that only barrios know how to do you know um, so in that way I think Barrio Anita is really special you know we we, we have our problems you know we have. Um, a lot of issues still with, unfortunately, um, folks experiencing homelessness who, um, who are using and selling drugs in the park. That's probably one of the major kind of like things that we're working with and trying to help those folks, but at the same time also trying to keep our community and the kids especially, you know, safe. Um, we have issues with, uh, um, as I said before, the gentrification happening. And we have a huge chunk of the barrio right now that's been an open space that the city is trying to figure out um, if they want to sell or not. And so trying to preserve that has been a big thing too. Great, thank you, Rania, for that very good uh, sort of primer on, on where, where this happened. Um, and so moving into the project, uh, we, so I, I, I assembled a team partly also because we were part of something called the Creative Communities Institute. Uh, so it's a program sponsored by the Arizona Commission on the Arts and ASU's Herberger Institute. Um, and um, uh, a part of that was assembling a team that included city leadership, residents, uh, and then other, other partners that would somehow contribute to, to what was the, the goal. Um, and uh, for obvious reasons, right, like uh, having somebody from uh, Ward 1's office to uh, ask questions and to get resources, city resources, Put out there um, was you know really helpful throughout the process. Um, we started with canvassing the neighborhood. Um, this was uh, about six six months or so before the final the event. We had already been doing archival research uh, with a graduate student. We had a grant from the Arizona Humanities Council uh, to work with scholars at the university and through special collections and historical society go back and get a bunch of old photographs and newspaper clippings and sort of, sort of get the, the deep, deep history uh, as when it was an Apache settlement uh, in the uh, mid-1800s is kind of where it's sort of that, that story starts. Um, but we also went door to door to find out really from residents themselves, you know, what, 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 what were their concerns about the neighborhood? What did they like best about the neighborhood? How many generations have they been living there? Um, things, you know, sort of basic information. Uh, and what we discovered, um, the number one thing that people talked about was uh, that they didn't know their neighbors. Uh, there is the early stages of gentrification happening. You know, there's, there's people moving in, renters, uh, new homeowners, and houses being built on vacant lots. Uh, and uh, this was the biggest loss, I would say, from the, especially the families that have been there generations. Back in the day, you know, from the probably the 1930s and 40s, all the way through probably the 80s, 
there was ma these major families that were intermarried. They would, you know, get, there would be a marriage, a new house would be built, the, in the, in the property of one of their one of the families, all cousins, and and it's just uh, everybody. You know, when you know each other and you're bonded like that, you feel safe, you feel like you belong, um, it's, you're just happier, right? And so this was pretty much gone. Uh, and so that was like one major task we, we realized, the team of artists. There was um, several artists involved, Adam as a, a media, digital media artist, uh, Heather Gray as a videographer, Wesley Cree as a visual artist. Um, <coughs> And we got together and we're like, so what, you know, we started thinking about like ways that we could sort of create interactions amongst neighbors, but also to share this, um, this history with new arrivals so that if we all know the history, it's another way of sort of that glue that holds people together. Um, we, uh, of course, then did a bunch of oral history. Um, These are some pictures of the old neighborhood. Um, so we did, we did uh, about 20 oral history interviews with residents, uh, most of them still, that still live there, a few that spent their whole lives there and now happen to live out you know, in other neighborhoods. Um, and those were, uh, that's sort of where the, the, the oral histories ended up creating the, the basic meat that everything else was an offshoot from. Um, these are just some of the residents. Uh, this this uh, this matriarch in the middle, Mary Sanchez. She, she we interviewed her, and then she passed away before the event actually happened. That's her great granddaughter, uh, Marta, and then her daughter, Lupe. Uh, Marta goes to Davis Elementary. It's right there in the neighborhood. Um, and so we went to a lot of community meetings. At the time, there were neighborhood association meetings because the, the association had disbanded. Uh, almost 10 years earlier because of this other art project. Not just that, uh, just different differences uh, amongst residents. And so uh, Gracie Soto, uh, the owner of the one little store that, that uh, is still there, um, she started having community meetings. And there would be like five, six people would show up, kind of the same people each time. Uh, and so we'd go to those meetings to just, just try to find out, listening, as Michael Rowe talks about, it was civic practice ideas. Just listening, listening, listening as much as we could to find out, you know, what's going on, what's needed, what would help folks, um, you know, build this community and make it more resilient. Because I think it is resilient already. Um, and so we did. Uh, we were embedded for about a year, and uh, and then we figured out what we wanted to do, and we created the event. So there's a, a an Arizona Illustrated. A clip that I just want to show that kind of sort of gives you the whole overview. It's coming. We try to find as many ways to incorporate the neighborhood to, to, to include neighborhood residents in the making of it, not just like extracting stories from them. In the course of interviewing all these folks, we kept hearing about these backyard celebrations. And this is what people did before internet and, and probably really before TV took hold. And they would talk about being outside, and cooking, there's all this food. And there was live music, musicians, and there was dancing, and there was those who would be out. And many people talked about this with big smiles on their faces. And so I was like, okay, well let's let's try to recreate one of these backyard parties. We took all the videos where anybody mentioned a backyard party on the all the old history interviews. We put all those clips together and we, we projected them onto the tool shed there. So a lot of them were from in the, they marry within the lobby. So as you walk in, you start to hear it from the actual people, what these part of your life, and then you keep going deeper in and get an experience, a recreation of one. 
and then you get to hear the, the elders sing those old boleros. And then switch to a young person doing a, a, a poem, spoken word piece about the barrio. Here in Barrionita. And what it means to them as, as young people. Then how do I teach your niños to reach the promised land? You teach them that they are already here. And as they sit with the consejo, they notice the barrio yawn and open its eyes and it gives the same buenos dias that it's given to our escuela and our abuela for years. And, uh, and then the final element was, was the people, you know, the, the audience, just talking and enjoying themselves. The other big area of focus was the, with the four giant screens and the vacant lot. So she was into those things that we, we, we take for granted. That was a straight oral history, you know, just, just wanting to collect those stories. And then once we have them, you know, how best to present them. <laughs> gravitate to a certain screen and really like focus in on these stories. Some of the children that didn't get killed were sold as slaves in Mexico or given to rich families in Tucson to work as servants. The mariachi stage was in honor of Davis Mariachi, which was the very first after-school mariachi program in Tucson in 1983. That program gave birth to all the other ones. place, making sure everything was where it was supposed to be, and even through like my going back and forth really fast, I noticed beautiful things here and there, like the video playing over the house. Almost as if they had all come together and to pose for this big photo. I, I love seeing the pride. It really does create a cool vibe, right? Like that sense of ownership, like this is our place, like let's take care of it, let's be friends, let's talk to each other, you know, let's populate our underutilized space, which is our neighborhood. If we're proud of where we come from, then we're better humans to each other, right? So at the end of the day, it helps for everybody to know their roots and to understand that they have history and they have things to be proud of. We're trying to create the most beautiful, the most aesthetically pleasing, the most professional, high production values as possible. But we're working in tandem with community. I can't just be an artist for, for art's sake. Like there needs to be a real community building component to all of this. Otherwise, it's, it's not for me. some of these components, just really quick. Uh, right. So the, the video uh, ended up being the core sort of, sort of artistic product. Uh, these four giant screens were really uh, incredible to sort of like just walk into it and you could sort of, sometimes you could stand right in the middle of all four and just get this like montage of visuals and sounds. Um, but it was you know, also really great for residents to see themselves up there um, and talk to their young ones you know, uh, about it. Th this was uh, Adam's, one of his uh, most genius ideas. We did try to throw up folks onto buildings. So this was one of the buildings. There's a few others like on Davis Elementary that we threw up a bunch of photos of folks. Um, and then we also were able to, uh, there's a Ori Center and there's Ori Street. It's named after William Ori, uh, one of the pioneers of Tucson, the first mayor, first a lot of things in Tucson. He's also the uh, person that led the um, uh, uh, massacre of uh, mostly women and children, Arivaipa, Native Americans, uh, Camp Grant Massacre. Um, 
there was about a hundred natives uh, uh, killed there. They were they were under a peace agreement with the army that they were going to stay in this army camp. Um, they gave away all the weapons. They had made this deal, um, and there's a big long story behind that. That um, William Morey organized um, a group of mostly, um, you know. Sam, Sam Hughes, uh, he didn't actually go, but he supplied all the guns. Uh, a lot of the sort of founding fathers, um, and uh, they enlisted a bunch of the Hono Atam men as well, and uh, sort of just, just shot everybody. Uh, so we, uh, so some of the residents, you know, were like, uh, want to see the name of the, of the Ori Center changed. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of people that grew up and have no idea that who this person has many buildings and things are named after people. We really don't know who they are or why their their name is there. Uh, so there's a lot of people that think of Ori Park and like that's where I grew up. That's where I have all these great memories. And so we thought, well, maybe if we educate folks about who this person was and just leave it up to them, maybe maybe we'll change the name. Maybe they won't. But uh, we made this little documentary with um, uh, a student, a second grade student at Davis. Um, who was the narrator. Um, I did a bunch of research. We hired two young men from the neighborhood. Um, actually, one of Tanya's sons was one of, one of the men to be, to teach them uh, computer animation workshops. Uh, and so they did some of the animation, worked with Adam. Uh, and then uh, we showed this. And so I'm gonna show you just a little trailer. It's like a minute and a half. came to Tucson in 1856. At 16, he came to Texas looking for adventures. He was at the Alamo. At 23, Billy was still looking for a good fight. In his speech to the Pioneer Historical Society, Bill Gordon said, Not a single man of our company was hurt to mar the full measure of our triumph. A hunter and a Viper Apache were murdered just before dawn as they slept. Many of them were women and children. of um, just trying, you know, working with uh, the residents, uh, working with the youth, uh, really trying to integrate them as, in as many ways as we could. Uh, and really, and then we expanded that out um, and trying to work with different segments of, of the Tucson community on different parts. So the Shadow Theater component, uh, we did a partnership with the Mexican American Studies program at the university. There's a class of I think it was 80 students taking this intro next American Studies class. And we gave them all jobs to do. So 30 of them were assigned to shadow puppetry. None of them had ever done it, which is one of the great things about shadow puppetry. You don't really need any experience. Um, just put on some masks and you know, just have fun. Uh, and so we took some, so I had mentioned there are these previous oral history project, there was a, a series of small books that were printed in the early 2000s. One of them had a bunch of little cuentos or folk tales from the neighborhood. And so we uh, turned those into, into shadow theater. Um, and uh, people really liked it. Um, uh, so this is rehearsing at the university uh, with the students. Um, these are some of the masks we use. Um, as you saw in the video, also mariachi, it's a big deal here. Um, and Davis had the very first after-school mariachi program in Tucson in, in the early 80s. They're, they're pretty much almost, you know, many, many of the schools, elementary, middle, and high schools, 
And the high schools have some incredible, I think, professional level mariachis um, that all started at Davis, all started in Barrenita. Um, Wesley Cree uh, designed these mural panels, but uh, community members at different events in the community, uh, it was like a paint by numbers. So they were actually painted by students at the university and, and little kids at the rec center um, over a period of several months. Uh, we made fresh tortillas, you guys didn't get the tortillas last night, sorry. Uh, Pima Community College, uh, Mil Tortis, so we met her, um, you know, runs Borderlands with me, uh, taught her, was teaching a movement class at Pima, and so her class project was to do uh, a choreographed piece to one of the oral histories, uh, so that's them doing that. You know, the poets roamed around, not just in the garden, but throughout the entire event and did their poems, and that was also about a three-month project as they developed and, and researched the, the neighborhood. We had an architectural tour. We had an architect uh, from a different barrio, Barrio Blue Moon, Shariah Jimenez, uh, but she's an architect here in town, and she gave a really cool walking tour um, of the piece. And then we also had, a, part of this, right, was also to bring the actual residents a little more to know each other uh, so we have a current resident VIP area. I'll let Tanya talk a little bit about what, what was going on with the, the VIP area. Um, so the VIP area essentially was just a you know, sectioned off area. We had some food, um, we had people be able to sign in. We distributed some surveys um, to get a little bit more information about just their level of satisfaction with the event, but also their willingness to participate in future events. Um, and then we had just kind of some prompts, you know, other people walking around encouraging people to um, talk to each other and share with each other. Uh, and that was kind of a, I just, I just want to share one thing. I, I saw such a beautiful thing at the VIP tent when I was there. Um, I think I just stopped by for something, but it was a, you know, an older man, I think, and maybe his granddaughter was there. She was maybe eight or 10. And it was, you know, they were, they were kind of walked up to the tent and, and said like, oh, I guess maybe we're not allowed in here. And maybe Tanya was there, I forget, but, you know, said like, oh, welcome, welcome, this is just for neighborhood residents. And it was the coolest thing to see the little girl, you know, kind of swell up and be, you know, get such a cool feeling of pride from living in the, in the barrio. And that was, that was great. Uh, and that happened a lot, uh, that sense of pride or big giant smiles. Like, I mean, it, people were happy. Like, like, happy. Like, and you know, as an artist, when you put your work out, you want, this is what you want, right? Um, I, I don't know, that's a selfish reason. I mean, that's not the reason I do it, but I certainly love it. Um, and, uh, not, not for my ego, but like to make someone, like, because they're so happy. That they're acknowledged, they're, there they are, there's their nana, or, you know, telling the story that they maybe they've heard that, especially the youngsters, they, they hear the story from the old timers, you know, and, but when you see it with production values and all these other strangers have put all this time into it as well, then they're like, oh wow, I guess that's important, right? Like, you know, um, and, and so, and people that you don't often see happy, big old smile, like a side of them I've never seen, brought their, their whole thing, their, their nanas. I mean, these are like middle-aged men bringing their nanas as well, and they, they become little boys. Um, or maybe they're always little boys. Um, but it was really great. Um, and so, um, as far as the impact, um, I just wanna, uh, you know, like the, there was elections uh, the week after that the association was reestablished. Uh, there was, feel like there was about, 60 or 70 people that showed up, which were like a neighborhood elections of like 200 houses, and some of those houses are vacant. That's a pretty good turnout. Um, You'd normally expect seven or eight. Seven <laughs> yeah. or eight. Uh, people ran for board positions, young uh, parents, single parent, you know, uh, that in their 20s had never done anything like this, and won, and now they're, they're the secretary, or you know, they're, they're, they're taking part of uh, the direction of their, of their neighborhood. Um, and uh, uh, our Ori Pool, 
that was closed, been closed for like 10 years or so, um, was reopened, um, or it's gonna be. And so maybe you can talk a little bit about that because the, the word one had a big part in that. Yeah, um, a, a few, I mean, the, a lot of changes in the, in the kind of way that, that our city council office hears from Baranita and works with Baranita. The pool is one great example, um, you know, that the neighborhood really kind of came together and, and you know, said we want a pool, that we want our pool back. You know, it's been sitting just behind chain link for eight, 10 years or whatever it was. Um, so, you know, our office uh, had begun some efforts prior to this, but really ramped them up in terms of finding the dollars to, um, to reopen the pool, um, which is great. And, you know, in terms of other results, we're hearing from Barrio Anita way more, um, whether it's, you know, find the folks calling, say, come fix my potholes, that maybe didn't call before, because um, maybe they thought, oh, maybe the potholes are just there, cuz. Uh, you know, and, and, but, but it's, you know, it's folks taking, you know, ownership and pride in their neighborhood and saying, hey, we don't deserve a pile of garbage in our park. Um, so it's great for us to be hearing from the neighbors like that. Um, and yeah, and, and I think, you know, Barrianita has really become central in this, you know, community-wide discussion about gentrification too, because, you know, it was part of that conversation before, but I think it's a lot more prominent part of that conversation now. And, you know, really just awakening the civic pride that, that's really cool to see, so. And Tanya, can you just talk a little bit about sort of in the aftermath of the event and just living there and your interactions and her recovery? Sure. Um, you know, I think that it, it's hard to it's hard to express because when you live in when you live in a barrio and you see um, kind of your your outward world reflective of internally sometimes how you feel when a lot of people are living in crisis, especially economic crisis and you know all these other all these other um, in, things that, that, that impact communities negatively. Um, there's kind of like this this lull that gets created, right? There's kind of this this almost like, well, this is just what it is. Um, and what I really saw happen was that that event served as this, this catalyst, this kind of like reinvigoration, reawakening, whatever kind of term you want to use, that all of a sudden the, the um, kind of like the sleeping giant awoke, right? And, and so it can't be underestimated how important physical environment is, right? And when you have that, the beautification, even if it's just temporarily, right? Even if it's just in that moment where you're allowed kind of that glimpse into what that looks like and another possibility, that grounded with people who, who, who get a reestablished sense of pride in place, then yeah, I mean, it's like the possibilities become endless because then not only do people start saying, oh, wait a minute, maybe we can do this. Then you kind of ramp up to the next level of like, oh hell no, we need to have this in our neighborhood. Like why is our pool infested by mosquitoes and it looks disgusting and that's just another in your face moment every time you gotta drive by that pool that's torn down and disgusting that you're like, what, we don't deserve to live in a space that's equally as beautiful as somebody who lives in the richer area of town? So I think that that level of consciousness that you can't in any way quantify or even just fully describe, that is what I saw happen. Because I think even neighbors who, um, or residents who aren't even physically living in the neighborhood, but maybe who had lived before, but they saw their family there, they became interested in participating. And all of a sudden you see people on the street more. You know, you see um, people, um, engaging, you see people, more people at neighborhood association meetings. And you see, I think, just people in general kind of having a sense of like, wow, I can walk to my neighbor and be like, yo, do you need help? Or um, like, you know, pick up the trash in my front yard. Or, you know, there's just this, this, this reestablished kind of energy that's been created in the, in the, in the community um, that I think that, you know, inevitably would have happened because, you know, I don't want to dismiss or take away from the, the um, the kind of resiliency and the strength of the community members themselves. But I think that this event is what, and just the work that's been done there, is was the difference between this being 
a five, ten year process of people kind of talking and you know how, you know, there's kind of, there's plateaus and there's lows. The difference between that and it being this jet kind of take off, you know, accelerated process, I think was. Yeah, and, 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 and by no means, you know, it, it was like the start. Uh, we got a, a year two, just, just finished writing a set of grants for starting in 2019. Uh, want to continue working with the neighborhood because really it's like now we have everybody's attention, but now we have to actually start working together, uh, and and that's and that's a process. Uh, it's it's not like just gonna magically all get fixed, right? So uh, so that's it, we're just we're still in the starting of it. I mean, the, all this preparation was just really to get everyone's attention and get people excited, which I think we did. But now the real work coming, moving forward, you know, dealing with this homelessness issue in the park, uh, uh, just consensus building uh, amongst the neighbors, right? Uh, like any group of people, we're all coming with different experiences and our own set of baggage and all this, and you know, it's like a family, and you don't always get along. So finding those ways to do that. So that those are our projects coming up for the, the coming year. Um, uh, overall, I think uh, everyone involved learned a ton about this kind of work. Um, uh, the, the partnership for the NET grant that we got between the university and also Spoken Futures, there was a lot of exchange between the three borderlands, Spoken Futures and the university as far as, um, you know, students, university students and faculty, like hands on really digging in and creating as part of their curriculum this kind of work, it was a fifth of their grade for these 80 students, 20% of their grade. Uh, and Spoken Futures, uh, just kind of stepping up their, their production values and their more theatrical side of the work they do. Um, us working with, with youth poets and also working with a university institution and how do you make these things gradable and how do you make them lesson plans that are used in the classroom. Uh, so, uh, and then mostly though, working with, with communities, working with people on the ground. And, uh, you know, we present to you like this nice, clean, polished thing. But there was many, many a meeting that nobody showed up. You know, no residents came and tried bribing them with gift cards. And there's all kinds of tactics that came and went, trial and error, until we finally figured out how to get people to, to like pay attention in the development. And, and there was certainly like, sadness and dejection apart, you know, we're sensitive. The artists, like when no one would show up, and get really sad. So like all of that was part of it too. Um, but overall, you know, really proud and very excited to, to continue the work with Madre Anita. Um, so I think there's probably about 20 minutes or so of our time. Uh, if anyone has any questions, happy to ask. Yes. I want to start with an early question because I don't want to leave on this note. The work is so powerful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But when stuff's powerful, it's powerful to do good, and it can be powerful to not do good, to cause harm. And you mentioned a mural project that caused harm and distrust in the community. And I don't want to live there, but I'd love to hear what screwed up there, why, what was, just from your, I know it's just your opinions, but what, what didn't work that caused harm from artists working in and or with community? Yeah. And I think you, you in the, it, ironically, you answered the question, the answer, you answered the question in your question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the, the, the artist did not work with and through community. So there was outside artists, there was limited interaction with communities, there was little respect paid to the, also the existence of artists that, that resided even literally within that community that were masters of that same discipline, um, content, all of that was was not something that was that was decided upon by the community. And you know, I, I I'm a I'm a um, I believe I believe in a lot of, of the the things outside that, that we don't see all the time. So in my mind, now the tile is falling apart. The structure itself is 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 literally um, coming undone. I think there's something more to that than um, than just shoddy work. Um, and so I, I, I envision someday, and we've had people who've looked at it who have said probably someday that thing will have to be completely taken down because it'll serve its 
it's becoming dangerous, right? Like the structure itself might eventually fall down. So, so I'll, leave it, I'll leave it with that. <laughs> I'll bet in their grant applications, they said they were working with the community. With the association. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and TPAC uh, was a big part of it, but it was like five, 400,000, it was giant. Oh, and, uh, no, the, it was this mural and uh, the Tucson P Pima Arts Council, uh, which has a new name now, and they were one of the big funders and the, and the association was a funder, but it was like a $400,000 project and they flew artists from another state in, and they, it was, you know, one of those kind of things. Any other questions? <laughs> juxtaposition is a critical conversation in the sense that as artists we're often pushed to have some other reason to do our projects or our work because doing it to engage conversation or to, to just do it isn't enough it's not good enough to be an artist you have to be an artist who does social worker community work or one thing or another if you want funding and so I think a lot of artists do an add-on or they think of this idea without having any idea or any sensitivity to what they're actually doing to people. And that when government money or money comes in and is offered requiring that you do this, it doesn't say. It has to come from inside and you have no training or thought about that. Juxtaposed to that is this remarkable project that started from inside and grew up. And that model of that, not only with the passion that you have for that, but the way in which it blossomed and the seeds grew and the way that it actually became something that's owned by the community, that the community is going to shape and reshape over and over again as it claims its own artfulness is delightful. You know, it's just an incredible model juxtaposed to the other, which was top down rather than ground down. I think one just it made me think of it when you said this, but one of the things we did during the actual event was inside the Hoy Center there was a map, um, you know, like that parcel map that we saw there, and people were filling in there where they lived and stuff, and it was anyway, it just made me think of that, and it mostly got filled up, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, and and there was you know like uh, I mean there's so much I couldn't cover it all, but like there was a a, a Mike Acedo. Many generations, it lives in Barrio Centro now, but like certainly grew up there and his, his ancestors. He and his family put together this entire historical display going back to the 1880s with photographs and these pan, I mean like professionally, like he had a mount, phone mounted and everything. Uh, and, and it really made it this, like Ori Center, the inside, this like museum really. Uh, with, and they had, Ori Center brought out all the trophies of the softball teams from going back to the 1950s. And, uh, and it was this whole other thing that I had nothing to do to curate. And it was a fully curated museum thing that happened in there. They just, these old residents, older residents from a long time, put together all on their own. And then Mike uh, barbecued carne and uh, collected, you know, donations. And he made like $400 that he donated to Borderlands. Like his whole family barbecued all night long. You know, when you're doing community building or you're doing movement building, there's different energies that you can use, right? Like, and sometimes it comes from this really raw, like, angry place. Sometimes it comes from this, you know, almost like nostalgic kind of place. And I think that the art is knowing what to use and kind of what combination. And what I thought was really the genius of, of what Mark and his team did is that, especially taking into consideration so many um, elders that were in the community, was that this was the opportunity to use some of that, the, the beauty of remembering, you know, and, and that nostalgic feeling. And, and my, my skepticism kind of at first, because I tend to, to organize maybe from a different place, or that had been my experience, was seeing how, how powerful that could be, that, it, that, that from this place of, of just 
just love and kindness and, and family and unity and all of those things that I was like, okay, yeah, you said it's going to work. Okay, I believe you. Um, but really that that's, that was what motivated those people. That, that you know, that you, the nanas and the, you know, I'm thinking of the nana that shared the story of which she organized in the school and then she moves back into the community and, you know, nostalgia and, and memory and memory of place and time, those are really strong emotions. And trying to recreate that in, in, in the now I think is um, is kind of it's it's yeah it's it's unique kind of happening there. All the way in the back, yeah. Yeah, I'm really curious. You spoke a little bit about um, where there was like difficulty or disagreement, or y'all had to change course and tactic. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more about like what like frameworks or values you use to guide those conversations to make sure that you were centering the community and their voices in your work. Um, well, a lot of the, the sort of redirecting had more to do with artists finding ways to um, uh, get the interest of residents, you know, to, to participate. And certainly, so, you know, we try to have uh, like community art workshops was something we tried early on, uh, and you know they, there was like like four or five people came. Uh, we try to have uh, other kinds of like uh, like uh, we had uncovered quite a bit of historical and archival information, so we try to have some some evenings at the at the center where we would like share some of that history with people um, and these different ways and then as we like I said like we tried to give, like I had gift cards sometimes that I gave away or food and uh, so the initially was just trying to get that engagement uh, and we did that you know like going door to door was one way and that was pretty successful um, but as, as we found that like people wouldn't show up to something or we weren't quite getting the numbers we wanted or the level of connection that's when we sort of go back to our production meetings um, and for us, I don't know if there's a certain kind of theoretical framework or anything. We just kept like trying to think of new ways to get to entice residents to show up. And we thought if we could just get, you know, like it's hard to explain even to like another artist, like all the love, like what we're trying to do. And, uh, you know, much less just your sort of average civilian, you know, resident, you know, neighbor. Uh, and so like, it was like, how do we like, give them a taste? So finally, when we had videos, we had oral history videos at a certain point, and we told everybody that we, about the, then we, we'd interviewed about 12 people. And we're like, hey, we're gonna show a clip of your video. And, it, and the main reason was very practical, like, wanna make sure you're cool with it before we put this on blast, and wanna get your feedback, this is the time. This is one of many times throughout where we had to go back and check in with residents and make sure they were cool with everything. And, and, by, and so when, when someone's like, oh, oh you're gonna show my video, my face, oh well, yeah, I wanna, you know, I wanna come in. Either because it would be fun to watch myself, or because yeah, I wanna quality control it. And so they would bring their whole families, and, and so we finally had this event where we showed little clips, and we had like 40, 40 people come. And once they saw what it was, and got a better sense, there was a little editing, a little music put behind it, um, then they were like, oh, this is what you're trying to do. And from there on, people were showing up to different things and we had the buy-in at that point. And, and so I think that's to answer your question. I think also Mark is, um, he's really persistent in a good way, you know? Like he, it was kind of like, oh, this guy, he's really putting, he's really doing what he say, says he's gonna do and we'd be at meetings and I'm like, oh, Mark's here, hey, Mark. <laughs> Every neighborhood meeting, you know, any kind of meeting, he'd be there. And I think that, that that spoke, I think, to residents about this isn't just like in the past where somebody came and they wanted to take something yeah, from yeah. us, yeah. Um, but this is really somebody who's yeah. committed and they're here and they're participating and they want to really, like, they, oh, he, he really, really does want to hear what we have to say. <laughs> that persistence, you know, and that commitment, like, nah, you can't, you can't yeah. underestimate that. Right. Yes. Tanya lives there. She was she 
Sue is our, our bio representative. Could you repeat the question? Uh, yes, if there's anybody from the neighborhood on, on the leadership team. And then there was one of the teachers from the neighborhood school who was on. Yeah, yeah, we got Barcelo who he's works in the Yeah, he's there he's quite a bit. He knows, and he knows, like, Julian was instrumental, so he's the one that making that tole last night. But uh, he's been teaching in that neighborhood for, I think, 11 years, and he knows all the all the grandmas uh, that have their kids that come, um, and, and, and the other parents, uh, really well. And so he was instrumental in like getting people to agree to have let us interview their oral histories, because he, he would make the ask, and they trust him, and so he, and he, he came to pretty much all the interviews as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that there were new, that there were new residents, I mean, I, I, I talked to a, a couple of them, and maybe Tanya can talk as far as like the association meetings that they've shown up at. Uh, at the event, um, you know, they, I think what I felt was that they were, and, I mean, this is not like a scientific study, or anything, but for the anecdotal sort of evidence that I gathered um, was a lot of appreciation, and like, I, oh, I didn't know, and like the sense of like, oh, this is really cool that I, I live in a neighborhood with this kind of history. Um, and so, but you know, they, they, they came to the elections and they, they came to the meetings. I don't know if they're, you know, if we can talk about like. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think there's like in any neighborhood, there's people who move in and they're like, yeah, I don't have anything to do with the neighborhood, I'm just living here. Um, and then there's the people who have a genuine interest in being part of that community. And so I think that the, for, for people who have, are newer in the community, I see a lot of them, you know, that are coming to the neighborhood association meetings or if they can't come to the association meetings, you know, I've seen them at neighborhood cleanups or I've seen them at, you know, I think, I think it's like in any place when you're kind of a newer person, you're a little apprehensive, like where do I fit in? Um, but what I see, I think that's equally important is space being made for those people when kind of like they, they, they show up for a while, right? Like the whole thing with the persistence, like they've shown up for a while and then you start seeing some of the older neighbors kind of being like, oh, hi, you know, how are you? And at first, maybe not so much because it's like, well, what are you, you know, you're new here. We don't, are you a friend or are you a foe, right? Like, and then after a while, it's like, oh, I've, I've seen you around now. You've come to this and this and this and then, you know, you start seeing those relationships. Develop. Yeah, and it's and it's it's slow, you know. That's why we're this coming year we're going to continue having, instead of having one giant event, we're going to have a bunch of little events throughout the year, just to provide more opportunities for these these two sides of the neighborhood, right? The new arrivals versus the long multi generational resident, to to because they're 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 in it together, we like it or not. I mean, they're all living there, uh, and so it's, you know, my hope is that the the trust can build. Uh, and that as the new arrivals learn what is to be, what needs to be um, uh, 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 not, not lost, you know, we want to make sure we don't lose the character, the very thing that makes the neighborhood what it is, uh, you know, hopefully they will sort of jump in on, on board with that. Well, and just also just to chime in, you know, certainly this is all about the conflict and which is, you know, Maybe uncomfortable for some folks, but nobody's moving forward unless the, you know, the conflict and the discussions happen uh, between those groups. And uh, you know, we, we saw a little mini version of it during the elections, for example, right? Yeah, yeah, around the last neighborhood association meeting. Yes. And, I, and I think the art pr provides. Oh, sorry. I was just reflecting on this because I don't want to give the impression that we're like, we're so fun, you know, whatever. But when in the neighborhood association meetings, you know, there's some knockdown, drag out fights, right? Because now we're not talking about the, the kind of like nice out there, la la, let's hold hands in theory. Now we're talking about, well, you know what, you're parking in front of my driveway or you're supposed to clean up your yard. And in those meetings, we've seen more of, of um, some of people coming to heads and a little bit of the rift along the you know what, you're not gonna come in here and tell me after I've lived here for 10, you know, my family, 10 generations, and you're trying to recreate maybe where you came. This is, you know, we've had, like the statement was made at a last day of the association meeting. This is a barrio. And you knew you were moving into a barrio when you moved here. So get with the program, right? So, <laughs> so there's, there's, there's yeah, and there's been attempts to kind of be like, well, let's not make this um, uh, like, you 
you versus us kind of thing. And, and my thing has been, no, instead of like, a, let's not make this a you versus us, like you're, you're from here, we're not. Let's really just like wholeheartedly embrace that and say, that's real. And, and, the, and those are realities of you are from here. I can tomorrow, I don't know my home, I rent. I can tomorrow, I could in theory, pick up my kids, get in my car, drive over to, uh, to Capilla where the rest of my family lives, right? And move in there. These people, some of these people, they're not going anywhere. They own their homes, their grandmas live there, their grandpas live there, their tia died in their backyard, they're, you know, they had their first kiss, they had their first car accident, their first fight. That's, you know, that's, that's real. And so I think that right now in, in, the, in the shaping of community, it's not about let's try to like build bridges between the two. It's kind of like let's respect the distinct camps for a minute and then see where are the opportunities to coexist, right? Like none of us want to live in a trashed out neighborhood. None of us want to live in a neighborhood where our kids aren't safe. None of us want to live in a neighborhood where we can't afford to live. Like let's pick these points that we can collectively agree upon and then kind of try to build off of that. For me, with Borderlands as an artist working this way, you know, what really gets me going is, is because what I noticed, right, with this event and other things I've done, is when you put the art in, it's like this, this other space. It's not the sort of space of conflict that people are more familiar with. Like what she's saying, you're parking in my driveway and this kind of, it's this, it's, it's kind of like a, a foreign space that people aren't as used to being in. And it's also a very beautiful space. And it, it, it provides these moments, these breaks from the sort of day-to-day conflict or struggles and it and it and it opens it up and changes perspective and and it affects the heart uh, and it and so it's a, it's a nice sort of like these it's a break from like sort of how things are usually happen day in and day out and in that space it really allows people to see things a little different or give someone a chance to be heard in a way maybe they haven't been heard or see someone in a way they hadn't seen them uh, and that's really, you know, that's something that I'm trying to continue to sort of perfect or, or just uh, 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 develop, like how art can be infused into conflict situations in neighborhoods that lead to community development. Um, and you know, like I'm working now researching in Nogales, uh, we're trying to do the body stories down there on both sides of the border. Um, you know, we wrote a grant to do a uh, lot of stories in, in South Tucson uh, with Primavera Foundation, the time it works for. It's doing a lot of work there. And so, my, you know, our goal is to, and you know, I think this is one of the futures of American theater. It's not the only future, but, you know, um, it still gives, as artists, us the opportunity to work and make the most beautiful things we can make, uh, but also in collaboration with, with non-artists, right, and, and a whole, range of kind of not just the community members but there's all kinds of other partners to be brought into it and it's uh it's very exciting you know um i just was sitting here crying you know because there's so much that i'm being triggered by with the story i live in houston on the west side which is a, a historical community and um that had uh its own airport and, and so much promise that then was undermined, like you said, like normally in barrios and hoods and what have you. And, um, and the choice to live in a community with people who look like you um, and the sacrifice it takes with that because I have two daughters and, and um, my husband was saying, you know, maybe you wanna, we want to, um, initially I wanted to live in, continue to live in Third Ward, uh, which has become really gentrified. Um, I moved there in 83, knew that the housing and everything was going to shift, it was going to get expensive one day, and not be able to live there, um, be priced out of a community, then have to live in a community with your people, and you see dumping everywhere, garbage everywhere, walking with my family, and then having to drive my children around communities for other things, and then to see another neighborhood look one way, and my neighborhood look another way, it's very painful. Um, the camp. Uh, what was the name of the, the uh, story? Camp the Grandmaster. So then here with that story, we have Camp Logan in Houston. The same story, the same exact story. Um, camp the Child that happens in, um, in, in, uh, in Europe with Africans who work to, uh, to fight the, with the French. And, was, and the same thing happened to them. They were not prom they were promised 
things, and, and they were sleeping, and they came and killed them. It's the same, the same stories over and over. The, the train station, I mean, the, the railroad, and how that caused things, and the, the, uh, the, the highways uh, coming and destroying communities and families that lived there. Uh, when I first moved to Houston, I didn't know that 288, uh, which was a highway that they built, and it destroyed neighbors, and, and my friend's mother had to move. I grew up in the Bronx. I didn't know that the Cross Bronx Expressway, uh, which was a part of Trump's father, and how that destroyed communities. So it's just like hearing the same thing over and over and over again everywhere. But the promise was just, because I, I decided to uh, grant with alternate routes and uh, communities, par communities and partners to do a, a story around elders in the community and extraordinary elders film projects that we're doing, which is similar to what you're doing right there, and working to work towards this uh, We Matter, Stop Litter um, pro project as well to address some of the same issues that you're doing. So I just wanted to thank you so much for the work that you've done and um, to, you know, I hope Clay and Half Faith and Spirit will continue to bless you in the work that you're doing because it's such important work. Thank you. So I, I think we've reached our, our, our time. So I just want to close by uh, just again thanking NET for uh, being one of the prime funders of this project and also for you know allowing us to, to talk a little bit about it during this conference. Uh, and also, uh, you know, there was about 200 people involved in this project. Uh, you see like a very small representation of all the interns and community partners and young people. So um, yeah, thank you all very much. Mm -hmm.